Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey webinar. Uh, the topic is marijuana in the workplace. And this program is a part of the Drugs Network in New Jersey initiative that the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey offers to business owners, nonprofits, um, and those in the public sector to uh, help you establish a, and maintain a healthy and safe workplace. And as we all know, uh, back in November 2020, legislation was passed in New Jersey, um, or uh, there was a vote to make uh, marijuana legal in um, New Jersey, the use of marijuana legal in New Jersey for uh, adults. And we're still waiting on some of those regulations and to find out exactly what that will look like. And that's what today's um, webinar will address. Uh, we have two expert panelists that have been with us before and, and never disappoint in their uh, expertise on this issue. So I'm so pleased uh, to introduce them. We have Nancy Delu, who is um, presented first for a number of years, and she is a shareholder at Littler Midland PC and a nationally recognized authority on federal and state drug-free workplace policies and drug testing issues. And she spent most of her career focusing on this issue. So thank you, uh, Nancy, for being with us today. And we have thank Lauren Marcus. Thanks. Uh, and we have Lauren Marcus with us. She's also uh, done a number of uh, recent webinars with us. So uh, Lauren is also a shareholder at Littler Middleton and works out of their Newark, New Jersey office. She represents employers in various aspects of employment law and regularly advises and counsels clients on a wide, wide variety of day-to-day -day issues. Uh, Lauren has authored a few of our Drugs at Work in New Jersey quarterly updates that we provide to uh, all of our members, which I know we have many uh, on with us today. So, so welcome and, and thank you, Lauren, for being with us today as well. Thanks, good afternoon. And so um, with that, I just wanna mention that uh, a recording of this presentation and the slides will be available at the end of the event. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over uh, to you. Thanks, Angela. Um, thanks for having Lauren and I. And for those of you who are paying attention correctly, yeah, I'm the lawyer who sits just outside Washington, D.C. and talks about the law and what the marijuana law ought to be and, and what it is, what I think it is. And Lauren is the woman in Newark who then has to deal with the advice I've given and apply it on the <laughs> ground. So we we wanted to, you know, kind of join you today and go through our presentation, do a little bit of a, um, you know, a, here's what the law says, here's how we think it works out. Um, you know, it, we're not going to give you legal advice today exactly, right, because you're not our clients. We're going to give examples and hopefully they will be useful to you. Uh, you know, without going back to the end of the presentation to say like, you know, and as you implement this, you should check with your own employment counsel. I, let me just say that, right? We're, we're going to give you what we think the law would be, but I'm always amazed, um, you know, when we actually get the facts in front of us, um, really similar seeming situations can have very different outcomes depending on the nuances of those facts. So the presentation today is managing with marijuana in the workplace, and that's Lauren and I um, shoulder to shoulder <laughs> um, in case after the presentation you need contact information. I'm not going to read the agenda here, and I'm not actually going to follow. We're not going to follow like a particular like section by section agenda necessarily, but the goal is to give you an overview of the law on recreational marijuana, primarily a little bit to medical marijuana what you can expect, what you can require, uh, talking about impairment performance, can we test, and you know, leaving for last to the extent we haven't already covered these things, how to update your drug-free workplace policy and procedures to the extent you might not have done that already. So marijuana in the workplace today. <laughs> oh, before I ask Lauren to talk a little bit about like the law that passed in New Jersey and what's been happening since, because she's actually very involved with that. I just want to talk about our use of the term marijuana versus the use of the term cannabis, because the New Jersey laws all talk about cannabis. And that's fine. Um, from an employment perspective, we typically don't really care about all cannabis. We care about marijuana, or what we do is we care about THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. That is the element or the psychoactive component in marijuana, right? That's what makes you high. That's what the drug tests are testing for. And so if somebody was using 100% pure CBD that had no THC in it, that's not even illegal as a matter of federal law, as long as it has just only trace amounts of THC. So when we talk about 
uh, marijuana, we are talking about marijuana legalization, cannabis legalization, but we're focusing specifically on, you know, employment, employment, impairment, uh, positive drug tests, and the concerns that come with safety and things like that. So, um, you know, just to give you a, a sort of a shorthand term for the more focused look at cannabis that we are going to be taking today. Um, I will say, I get a lot of employers who say like, well, those, so then CBD uses, what if CBD use causes, you know, a positive drug test? It shouldn't, right? If you're just using pure CBD, might not matter anymore in New Jersey one way or another. But I will say that it's difficult sometimes to know whether a particular cannabis, cannabis product contains THC, which is why you'll see warnings, you know, even on um, products that are sold kind of in all 50 states that um, they, they shouldn't have any THC, they shouldn't cause a drug test. But if you're subject to mandatory testing, for example, they sometimes give a warning um, because there is no regulatory agency checking on them. So uh, that's why we're talking about marijuana today and not cannabis and not because we're just insisting on talking about marijuana and ignoring the New Jersey terminology. All right, Lauren, I've just put up the beginning slide. Do you want to talk a little bit how we got here? I know it's been like watching sausage making. Yeah. <laughs> So New Jersey does everything kind of slowly. So as many of you know, years ago, New Jersey passed a law um, legalizing medical marijuana. So that was the standard for a while. We were allowed to have medical marijuana. Employers had to accommodate the lawful use of medical marijuana. And then in November of 2020, they during the election, they put a referendum on the ballot for an amendment to the constitution to legalize recreational marijuana. And that passed, I think by like two thirds in New Jersey. So apparently everyone in New Jersey wants recreational marijuana. This was, the people had spoken. So they adopted this, you know, constitutional amendment, which didn't actually change anything. It just made it that then the legislature could pass a law legalizing recreational marijuana. So, in February 2021, Governor Murphy signed a bill legalizing the recreational use of marijuana. Um, and it's for adults over 21, I should clarify that. And then we waited a very long time while he had to appoint a commission uh, that would be issuing regulations, the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, which we just refer to as the commission. So. This law came out in February and it pretty much said, we're going to legalize recreational marijuana, stay tuned for the regulations. The regulations finally came out last August. And as Nancy and I are going to discuss are still incomplete. So <laughs> a lot, so, so in the law, the law contained a lot of information about who could buy, who could sell, who would be, you know, how towns could be zoned for this, a, a lot of marketplace information. For our purposes, the big, the big provision we're focusing on is about employee protections. So there's a section of the bill that protects employees that was supposed to, that was not effective until these regulations came out in August. Lauren, before I go forward with the slide, um, can you buy recreational marijuana yet in, in New Jersey lawfully? No, it's still, we're still in a holding pattern. Um, and I have to be honest, I'm not quite sure what the current timeline is, but um, they're still trying to sort through <laughs> yeah. this, this mess of who will be selling it and um, how that's so going that, to work. So it hasn't happened yet. Okay. So what does the law say about marijuana in the workplace? We're glad you asked. <laughs> this is probably the big one. This is, so employers are not permitted to refuse to hire any person or discharge or take any adverse action against an employee with respect to compensation or any other terms and conditions of employment because they do or do not use cannabis products. So... Oh. This is, this is huge. <laughs> what if I uh, am in a safety sensitive role? Can my employer move me to a less sensitive role because they know I use cannabis products? No, that would be an adverse action. So basically, thought so. <laughs> this, this statute that came out as we're going to discuss for the next, you know, 
50 some odd minutes, basically just ties employers' hands a whole lot. I'm sure a lot of you have already been dealing with this for the past year. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of been an interesting change. This was a really, really, this was a really big stand that New Jersey took that other states hadn't taken. All right. Well, also, the bill also provides employers can't take any adverse employment action against an employee because they've tested positive for cannabinoid metabolites, which we're going to call marijuana metabolites, right, for purposes of this law, since I've said that we're mostly testing for THC. Yes. So basically, the thought process is, right, if you're allowed to lawfully use marijuana off duty while you're not working, you can't fire someone just because they test positive, because that doesn't mean they're under the influence or impaired at work. It just means that maybe at some point in time, they lawfully used marijuana, which New Jersey is considering not just lawful, but really a protected action. Yeah, it's interesting. So can we continue to test for marijuana? The short answer is yes. The law actually lists, enumerates a number of different types of tests that employers could take. It employers can still conduct post-accident, reasonable suspicion, random testing, et cetera, but they really can't act on the results unless you can also prove that the individual was impaired at work. So we're going to kind of, you know, go through that. Um, before we kind of get through like how the law applies and things, you know, Lauren, are there any employers that are just accept, you know, outside the scope of this rule or law? Um, so the only way you're outside the scope of this right now is if you are a party to a federal contract that you would lose your funding or you would somehow be adversely impacted, like you're standing on this contract by not testing and precluding people on marijuana. So it's very interesting because everyone's, I know the questions, right? Like safety sensitive exemption. Nope, we don't have one of those. What about, you know, people who operate things? If you are party to a federal contract and you would lose your funding, then presumably, th then the law says that you're not governed by this. Um, but only if you would have an adverse impact. So it's not even like you're automatically just if you're a party to a contract. It's just you have to be party to a contract that specifically would not allow you to otherwise comply with this law. Yeah. And, you know, it's really um, I saw a question pop up. It's a it's a good one. You know, what if you ha are, you know have a federal contract that simply requires you to produce a drug free workplace um, that hasn't come up in New Jersey yet, but it did come up in Connecticut and the Connecticut federal district court said, you know, if you have uh, to promote and maintain a drug-free workplace as a matter of federal law, that simply means that you have to prohibit individuals from using marijuana at work. Um, that doesn't require you to do any drug testing. And so we think those two laws in Connecticut could operate side by side. And so, uh, we, you know, everyone's federal arrangement may be slightly different. Some may actually require testing, but the basic rule from the Drug-Free Workplace Act does not. Um, and so you're telling us that that would not be carved out. And if I'm a, right, Lauren, yeah. Right. And, and how do you think this impacts um, like DOT drivers and? Well, so DOT drivers, to the extent that they didn't carve out the, that group, those people who are, well, when I say DOT drivers, there's a couple of different levels of DOT drivers, but anyone with a commercial driver's license in the United States has to be part of a federally mandated drug and alcohol testing program and also pass medical standards that require the individual not to be using any kind of marijuana product. So I think, although it's not explicit in the law, it's been pretty clear, uh, you know, for the last 20 years that the DOT regulations, for example, preempt um, contrary state law that limit testing. Uh, and, and they've been very clear that the DOT still requires marijuana testing and prohibits drivers from using marijuana. So if you are an employer that has regularly uh, regulated drivers uh, who are subject to federally mandated testing or medical qualification requirements. I think that will, I think that's pretty clear that that should preempt the state law to the extent that the state law doesn't explicitly make that clear. Right. And I'm sure we will see something on that at some point. Oh, we will. We will. <laughs> okay. Well, I just to make sure we stay on track, because I know you guys are going to have a lot of questions. We don't have so very many slides, but we want to kind of go through the, the high level and then make sure we're answering your questions as we go through. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, so if you can only 
if you can't do any of this, like, you know, what's an employer to do? What about performance? What about impairment? And so here's a little bit about what the statute does allow us to do, right? It says that you can permit drug testing, as I alluded to, if you have suspicion of cannabis use while your employees at work. Um, at work, Lauren includes meal and rest periods, yes? Yes, okay. When you have observable signs of intoxication related to cannabis use, <laughs> if, if you can tell the difference, or following a work-related accident or at random or when scheduled or pre-hire. So you can still do all this drug testing. However, <laughs> you can take adverse action only if the employee is impaired by marijuana at work. A drug test can help show impairment, but you know, a pre-hire drug test is not. So just to kind of go back to this for a minute, the law says you can do pre-hire testing for marijuana, but it also says you're probably not going to be able to act on it. Um, as an attorney, I would prefer you not do any testing that you can't act upon because then you have reason to know that someone may be using a controlled dangerous substance uh, that you really can't take notice of. And either that individual is going to feel like you may be treating them differently or uh, maybe someone will claim that you're negligent for not taking steps to make sure that that person that you knew used marijuana wasn't coming to work impaired. Have you seen any arguments like that? Um, you know, I will say um, many large employers in New Jersey and small employers, uh, it's really been removed from a lot of the pre-hire screens. A lot of people have taken the position and made the decision to not test for that during the pre-employment screening. It's just, as you said, it's just not, it's not something to know about. You know, the reason we do the screening is that you want to weed out someone who, you know, even if it's a safety sensitive position, I, I agree. I think it's really risky to hire someone who tests positive for anything and put them in a position where it may become an issue. So I think a lot of people are just taking the position of, we don't wanna deal with it. Um, especially also, you know, New Jersey does still have its medical marijuana law. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. I understand it's been really supplanted by this for the most part, but if someone tests positive, you don't really know if it's recreational or medical. And so you could be putting being put on notice of a disability arguably, I mean, it just, it seems to me it's, I think a lot of people are taking the position, it's just extra information that if you can't do a whole lot about it right now, we don't that They'd it. rather not have it. Yeah. So think about this as you're thinking about your current practices, you know, if you can take adverse action only if they're impaired by marijuana at work, um, you know, why are you testing if you don't think they're impaired? Like it, you, there may be other ways to approach this. And we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, you know, one person uh, asked a question, uh, so why is this bad if, you know, they can do what they want to do at home, and then, but they can be disciplined if they come to work impaired. I think the, the challenge is that it's very, very, very difficult to recognize impairment if you haven't had a lot of training. And that kind of takes us into sort of, sort of the, the next thing. What is a drug test in New Jersey? It must include these scientifically reliable objective testing methods and procedures, uh, such as blood, urine, or saliva, which I think is not controversial. Um, we all uh, really, you know, agree with that, even if it's not required by a particular state law, that's a best practice. But it also requires a physical evaluation in, a, in order to determine an employee's state of impairment. And, um, you know, Lauren's heard me say this before, it's very, very difficult to become an expert on understanding whether someone is impaired. And how to do that right now, we're going to talk a little bit about this, is a little bit up in the air, but in general, if you're doing reasonable suspicion testing, you need to show that the person seems to be off in some way. They're not behaving the way they normally do. Um, you know, the, the maybe, they've in, maybe they've done something unsafe and have gotten into an accident. Maybe, um, you know, they're being unusually combative with coworkers or customers, just really strange things. Maybe they've got physical symptoms, you know, where they're you know, sweating or their eyes are dilated. There's a lot of different things it can be, but you don't have to know, right? What it, you, you don't have to believe like, wow, I think that's meth use or, oh, I think that they're drunk or, oh, um, maybe they're just having a bad day. You can just think, I don't know what this is. And so I'm going to get a test. It seems that New Jersey really is going to be asking employers to say, we think it's cannabis before even acting on that test. So this is like the definition of drug test has essentially been changed to be drug test plus drug test and 
some sort of physical evaluation. So how does that work? <laughs> Lauren, I'm just going to leave this whole concept to you, if you don't mind, because you've been no. taking part in the regulatory process here. And, and I'd say, I, I don't want to say I love this. I think this is very complicated, but I like explaining this because, you know, if you think back to the slide we just did, where it says you can drug test in these situations, in the statute in New Jersey, when they say drug test, they now mean what we think of previously as a drug test plus. So really almost all of the drug testing for marijuana arguably is almost like a reasonable suspicion now. It, it just, you have to have a physical evaluation plus the actual quote unquote drug test we used to, you know, we used to think of. So this is unfortunately the part of the day where I say, and this is why the regulations they came out with are incomplete. Mm -hmm. So the statute says, that basically there is going to be this certification. People are going to get certified. We're going to call them WIRES. It is a workplace impairment recognition expert. Oh, sorry, I went a slide ahead. So- I went No, no, there. I moved it up for you so, so you could go along with it. Yeah, go for so it. <laughs> these, are, these are WIRES, this is what we're calling them. And it means that these people go and get great training, apparently in consultation with the police training commission. So this is going to be more than you know, theoretically, you know, you just sign a piece of paper and say, oh, I'm a wire. This is going to be a process. You become a workplace impairment recognition expert. And that means that you are now certified to detect and identify if someone is impaired by cannabis. And that's it. This law came out in August. Those of you who heard Nancy and me speak previously heard us say, we don't know what that means. We don't know how you're going to become this. We don't know how it's going to work. Um, so I know a lot of the questions are, hi, do we have to have a wire at our workplace every day? What if we think someone, do we have to send them to a wire? How is this going to work? We don't know. The statute said that this would all be set forth in the regulations. The regulations came out in August. They explained a whole lot of detail. They were very lengthy. And when it got to the section about a wire, it said, oh, we're not doing that part yet. <laughs> they apparently got too busy trying to figure out who could buy and sell marijuana and they just kind of ran out of time, I guess. And so we still don't know. So this is still just a big old giant question mark and this big thing that's hanging over employers as we're going to have to do this at some point. We're going to have to find out what this means. And this is going to be what you're required to do. You're going to be required to have someone who is certified as a wire determine whether someone's impaired. It's a it's a great it's a great point, and I I want to say especially since Angela is like Nancy's been doing you know she, Nancy's our marijuana expert. It's got a, a mixed reputation there, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> you know why does it why can't you make some predictions about what a workplace impairment recognition expert or wire will be? Um, well, there's no other state in the nation that has this. Just so you know, <laughs> it's like and we'll we'll do a little bit more state by state comparison as we go through the presentation. But I did want to throw that out there. Like we have. They're starting from scratch. They're not going to be able to say, oh, well, you know, this is what Connecticut does and here's what Illinois does and not even New York. So, um, so there's that. All right, just to keep us moving through. Yeah, can, uh, the slides, the Cannabis Commission has yet to develop training or guidance. Instead, they've indicated, and this is maybe Lauren, like, I, I you know, I, I, it almost made it worse. It's like, go ahead and make indeter impairment determinations without the use of the wire, right? But they didn't provide any guidance beyond that, did they? No, and it's actually been so really confusing because exactly the regulations came out. They're like, we're not determining what a wire is yet. So just go proceed without one for now. However, I will say those are regulations. The statute itself still has the language that Nancy and I showed you earlier. So you're still required to do something. Just now you really don't know what. Now it's really in this gray area of I'm not allowed to make decisions based solely on the presence of marijuana, but I also don't have a wire. So basically employers are throwing their hands in the air and saying, where does that leave us? Yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> All right, so an employee shall not be subject to any adverse action by an employer solely due to the presence of cannabinoid metabolites in the employee's bodily fluid from engaging in conduct permitted by the law. That part is pretty clear uh, with or without the wire, a positive drug test in and of itself is not going to be 
uh, sufficient if your drug test, you know, shows the presence of cannabinoid metabolites. I mean, if your drug test shows the presence of something else, and we can come back to that a little bit later, there may be some room there. Um, but that's what mostly, certainly all urine drug tests are testing for. Um, so I want to just kind of put this in context before we go into some of the practical suggestions, because we did come, thank you, with practical suggestions. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what is the status of recreational marijuana law and how, how does New Jersey kind of measure up. This is a slide that just shows all of the different jurisdictions that have either legalized recreational marijuana or maybe more generally decriminalized. So for example, I live in Virginia and work in DC. Virginia has made marijuana um, not unlawful as of July 1st of last year, but there's no program to sell it. We don't even have a bill to pass that would like allow people to sell it. And there are, um, you know, there's, there's very little guidance there. It's just sort of like not a criminal thing right now. So um, here are the states where recreational marijuana has some sort of employment recognition, right, by jurisdiction. And so you see that's a much smaller group of states. And for those of you who are out of state or take, who like kind of know how this stuff works, like California has recreational marijuana and has for many years no employment protections if you if they employers don't want to hire someone who uses marijuana in california either medically or recreationally that is a-okay that is something they are letting the marketplace take care of so you know how does that play into having multi-state policies and doing different things well let me give you an idea of some of these employment protections nevada which i had up there their rule is you don't test pre-hire unless the job is safety sensitive. That's the entire employment protection. Montana just had a new law that said off work marijuana use is not a reason for discipline unless you, the employer, adopt a policy prohibiting it. They would just want you to be really clear about what, you know, the rule is. So people who come to work in Montana will know if there's a rule against marijuana use and testing is fine. Um, Illinois and Maine, you can't refuse to hire someone simply because the applicant says they've used marijuana as permitted by law, but if they actually test positive, you can decline to hire them. And then there's New Jersey and New York. Off work use of marijuana is protected and there is no adverse action unless the worker uses, possesses, or comes to work impaired. So to put this in context and why we're like, we don't really know, these are the jurisdictions where recreational marijuana use is protected and New York, passed its law a couple of months after New Jersey passed its law. And there is no regulations there yet either and no carve out for safety sensitive rules. So for those of you in other states, if you think things are different here, you're right. If in New Jersey and New York, you're wondering why don't Lauren and Nancy have more guidance about what is going to happen here? It's because you are the new frontier. <laughs> like You are trying new things and we are waiting kind of to see how it all turns out. Even Connecticut, which will have uh, recreational marijuana uh, in the middle of this year, has carved out entire industries from employment protections. If you're in warehouse, if you're in manufacturing, uh, a bunch of other things, the whole uh, obligation to consider employment protections won't apply to you. And then any job that's safety sensitive won't apply. So these are, you guys are sort of in the crucible right now, if you will. Uh, I know that's not helpful in terms of getting you to the next place, but I think it might be helpful in explaining why, um, why it's taking so long and why uh, there's a lot of you know, un un uncertainty about how it will all turn up. So, okay, updating your policy and procedures. What can our New Jersey policies require? I'm just going to put these up one after another, and Lauren and I will just kind of like jump in. It is okay to prohibit the possession and use of marijuana at work and during work time. And just when you think that seems really, really obvious, I don't know about you, Lauren, but I'm seeing more and more people bring marijuana to work because they're like, well, it's lawful now. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and actually, someone just asked us about the medical marijuana too. Yes, we're seeing people try to come to work under the influence and claiming that it's medical marijuana. You are allowed to have a policy that says you cannot be under the influence at, work. at all. Yeah, not used during work time, not not work, not, not, you know, if work starts at nine, you don't get to sit in the parking lot at 8.30 and get high. Okay, okay to discipline workers who come to work impaired, even if it's medical marijuana. Okay to drug test for marijuana, <laughs> we've already gone over that. Um, not okay to act on the basis of off work marijuana use permitted in New Jersey laws. This should be kind of a recap. 
we've covered this under the wire regulations, no expert opinion is required, but it's unclear what evidence will suffice to establish impairment. We have some concrete suggestions about that, but okay. I think we covered this, Lauren. There are no exceptions for workers in safety sensitive roles unless subject to federal regulations explicitly prohibiting such use. And I'm not sure we spell this out if you have another federal contract that specifically says you've got to test people. That's right. Yes. And and I'm just going to jump in just real fast. We're getting a lot. Yeah, of, go ahead. We've gotten some questions about what if we get federal funding? It, it's not tied to the money. It's tied to the contract. So if you get federal funding without being a party to a contract that says you have to have certain drug policies, there's not an explicit exemption for that. In That's the correct. Yeah. And I would say, you know, go look at the contract. If I will make it, I mean, a lot of employers are somewhat confused about this. They're like, well, we're a federal contractor. Federal contractors may be subject to the Drug Free Workplace Act of 88. And what that requires is for employers that provide services to the federal government or that receive grants from the federal government to actively promote a drug free workplace, tell people that, you know, drug use is dangerous and not good for your health, right? Not permitted at work. Um, if you are selling a product to the federal government, just the way the same product you might sell to any other customer, then that law doesn't even cover you. And there's a lot of confusion about that. It's not just any contract either. Your contract has to exceed the um, simplified acquisition threshold, uh, which is currently a quarter of a million dollars. Um, interestingly, if you get a grant in any amount, for example, uh, you know, a federal scholarship, then you're covered as an individual as well. So just be, you know, I know this sounds really lawyer-like, but if the question is, you know, we do business with the federal government, it does this cover us? The short answer is go read your contract because, we, you know, it could vary quite a bit. And the practical guidance is also uh, most people I've talked to have a contact that they negotiate with, someone that they work with to enter into those contracts, and you can reach out to them and ask them for some guidance and some help on, uh, yeah. you know, what your obligations are. Yeah, and if you've got medical marijuana workers and they're going to a federal site, even that's subject to you know negotiation with that federal site. So, there, so there's no a, easy answer. We're sorry. No, well, there is an easy answer, which is like you know, there's not one answer, but there will be an answer for you, and hopefully, it will be pretty clear. One thing we didn't dis uh, discuss, and the thing that's unclear, um, we talked a little bit about uh, regulated drivers um, and the fact that they're subject to testing, but. Right now, the law says nothing in the law is intended to allow driving under the influence of cannabis or driving while impaired by cannabis or to supersede laws relating to driving under the influence of marijuana or cannabis. So individuals who choose to use, I read this as individuals who choose to use marijuana must ensure that they don't engage in behavior that would lead to a DWI or DUI. What I'm less clear on is whether if you have employees who are using marijuana, you know, you have any right to say you can't drive the company car. Right. Which I, it's, it's hard because it does say under the influence. And so technically, it, or impaired, driving while impaired, but that doesn't necessarily mean just because you test positive or have trace amounts in it, are you not allowed to? Um, right. Yeah. And there was that medical marijuana case in New Jersey, the wild carriage case, where um, you know, which has kind of been all over the place, but it's definitely, th that was a medical marijuana case about whether someone, you know, whether to you had to, hearse, right? to drive, drive a hearse with a medical marijuana card and tested positive, but wasn't necessarily under the influence at the time. So I, I feel it's all unclear, but I think that based on the way the law has been going, it may be leaning in the direction of, you have to once again, be able to show actual under the influence or impairment. Um, but I guess we'll, that'll be a pretty, way pretty see, friendly right? toward the marijuana user. Yeah, I can see that we're probably gonna have some employers who say like, you know, it, I, I don't care, it's too safety sensitive. We're not gonna do it. And then there may be, there may be some, uh, uh, some c conflict that rises out of that. We shall see. So what can our policies require? Okay, okay to prohibit the use and possession of cannabis products at work and during work hours. Yes, including in any parking lots you control, right? Um, and it can be at, at work, you know, the during work hours could be if you send people to somebody else's site, right? Yes. Oh, this is, this is Lauren's favorite. 
What about out of state residents who work in New Jersey and use marijuana? So I will say that everything's unclear, but I've recently looked into this a bit. And while not providing legal advice, I will say the courts in New Jersey have taken a very broad stance in terms of who's covered by New Jersey law as an employee. And so if you actually work in New Jersey and your work is controlled by New Jersey and everyone's in New Jersey, I think that there definitely is an argument to be made that you are a New Jersey employee. Um, I'm sure that this will be litigated. I'm sure we will see coming down the pike, but uh, I definitely do not think it's clear that, you know, oh, you live in New York and work in New Jersey, you're not protected by this. I would say if you're a New Jersey employer, your employees are likely, your employees in New Jersey are likely, you know, covered. Yeah, and New York, New York's not really the issue, right? Because it's the only other state with a similar law. If it's more like, you know, somebody's coming from Delaware or Pennsylvania into New Jersey, um, they don't have the right at their home to use the marijuana, but they are a New Jersey employee, maybe covered by the law. Well, what if a New Jersey resident goes to work in Pennsylvania? I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, we think, you know, so the Pennsylvania law doesn't protect workers who use right. marijuana. There are some protections for medical marijuana users uh, with safety sensitive carve outs. But, uh, you know, if you're a New, New Jersey resident who goes and works out of state and you use marijuana, um, you know, I'd advise that you be pretty careful about that because um, just because you live here and can buy, you know, um, cannabis products in New Jersey doesn't mean that employers in other locations have to uh, follow the New Jersey line. And I'm sure that may be litigated, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, so here's, here's the big takeaway. Educating workers about your expectations and any changes in your policy will be crucial. Uh, if you are, you know, especially if you've got people who go back and forth or come from other states, um, and I, I saw we had the question about medical marijuana. If you've got medical marijuana users that you're accommodating, it's probably really important for everyone to know you can't bring it to work, you can't use it to work at work, you can't come to work impaired, um, you can't carry it in the company vehicle. Uh, if you, you know, if your job involves you spending a substantial amount of time in another state that doesn't permit marijuana use, and oh, by the way, you're driving a company vehicle, that may be a problem. So whatever, you know, if you are a medical marijuana user, you still cannot come to work impaired. And if we think that you're impaired and, you know, then we'll discipline you for that. And that might include a test and it might not. It might just be like, look, you're not doing the job, you're out of it. Um, so educating workers about their your expectations, I think are, are super important because as confused as you are, uh, they are more so. And I don't know about you, Lauren, but I work with an awful lot of HR representatives who are like, well, it's lawful now, so we just have to allow it, like in, in all kinds of states. And, you know, the fact that people are, are carrying it with them, for example, to the workplace, it has, you know, they're confused too. So if, if, if HR is confused, if leadership is confused, imagine your employees, right? So, so those, are, those, are the, those are the questions there. All right, should our testing policy change? Well, it depends on whether you've already changed it. I guess we kind of, <laughs> we kind of previewed this one, right? Uh, I think both Lauren and I are in agreement that although it's okay to conduct pre-hire marijuana tests, you really can't act on the results. It's okay to conduct random marijuana tests. It's difficult to act on the results. You would have to try to show that the individual was impaired at the time of the test, even though you didn't actually select them because of that impairment. And, you know, here's, here's another big unknown, but we're seeing a big shift to this in, in New Jersey and New York, oral fluids and blood tests. I am not a fan of blood tests. You need a phlebotomist. It's a medical exam. It's a blood drop, et cetera. I, I don't even know if they're going to be deemed lawful in most states, but oral fluids tests, which are the swab on the stick, they are only able to detect marijuana that's circulating in the individual's um, blood and oral fluids, um, uh, you know, at the time. And so, they're only capable of picking up marijuana use that occurred in the last 24 hours or, or less, right? Some of them may also not be looking for marijuana metabolites. They may actually be looking for whole marijuana in the individual system. Remember the law says you can't act based on a drug test that's marijuana metabolites. Um, I don't really know because we haven't had any litigation um, whether those tests will be deemed, you know, um, better evidence of impairment in a New Jersey state court. But my thinking is like, 
it's not really true that if you use marijuana once, you're going to test positive weeks later. But if you use chronically, and then you know, and then you stop, it can take up to 30 days to fill out, filter out of your system if you've been a heavy user before then. And it's a lawful product. You're probably going to have a lot of people who are heavy users. The urine tests are less helpful. The courts know this at this point that they're they're not going to show impairment. They're going to show recent use. An oral fluids test or another type of test, and I think that um, these test manufacturers are really kind of trying to hone in on this. They're not going to show impairment any more than a breath alcohol test shows impairment, right? But they may be capable of showing what's circulating in your system at the time. And so we do see employers shifting to those sorts of tests to say, like, we're really only focusing on what's in your system while you're here at work. And um, those of you that do testing, um, you know, maybe think about talking to your vendors, getting the science behind that. I'm a lawyer, right? I'm not, I'm not the scientist. I do know that some tests test for metabolites, some tests test for the, like the whole drug. I don't know if that's like, you know, which those are. And I don't know how, um, you know, whether those manufacturers would say that, that, you know, that's right. Like those, those tests are only measuring, you know, what's active in your system at the time you'd need to, to explore that with them. But I do think the smaller detection window just in and of itself could be helpful in demonstrating that the person came to work with enough THC in their system, right? That they could be currently impaired. Right, and, and I think that's just, you know, everyone should know just New Jersey has not adopted any sort of legal standard for like what qualifies as impairment, anything. I know some states have started doing that in terms of like driving under the influence and things like that, like New Jersey has not. So, I mean, this is a problem, even when you're talking about like police and DUIs and there's not really a current accepted way to demonstrate someone being quote unquote impaired by marijuana. I'm gonna put this question to you, Lauren. What if an employee used to use marijuana and got in trouble for it and promised not to use it anymore? Um, can they discipl be disciplined if they use marijuana now? If it is not medical, I, you know, I honestly don't know anymore. I think <laughs> I, th this is all kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Um, I will say that one part of I've the law- I've heard there's something that can help you with that. There's one, there's one part of the law that does say you cannot hold previous convictions for marijuana against people except in certain circumstances. So- that's a little side note when you're doing even just background checks, you should make sure that you're excluding certain marijuana convictions from the past because they can't be held against you anymore. Yeah, so, I've heard um, that in New Jersey, they've started expunging them, but they have a lot more to go. Is that is that fair? I, I believe so. Yeah, I think I think yeah. we're, we're we're a little slow over here. <laughs> it, it takes time to it takes time to unwind decades of law. Um, one of one of one of the other bullet points is don't test if you find someone in possession of marijuana or marijuana products at work. Why not? Because you don't need it. Right. You've got possession at work. Like the test is just going to muddy the waters and be like, were you impaired? Were you not impaired? The, the, it's okay to have a rule saying you can't bring it to work. One suggestion that I have had, and I've seen uh, it, both New, Jer New York and New Jersey employers do this a lot, is to sort of, if they if they haven't done it in a long time or maybe never, they're doing reasonable suspicion training for their managers and HR people um, to conduct reasonable suspicion training um, and to how to document observations of suspended impairment, suspected impairment. That's something that that you can do. Um, it, you know. Um, and then this was sort of my takeaway is like, well, what is it? Like, how do you know if someone's impairment? We don't have that guidance. As, and Lauren explained why, um, you know, assume you don't need to know why someone's, no, Samantha, uh, no, no wires are being trained. There are no regulations. There is no such thing as a workplace impairment recognition expert yet in New Jersey. So until we have more guidance, you have to assume that um, you need to know someone is impaired, but you shouldn't have to prove that you're like an expert on impairment or anything like that, because we don't even know what that would be. But documenting that somebody was behaving in an unusual manner, maybe having a checklist of things that were just different from what is normal, maybe a check, you know, said, you know, um, we, we tell people they can't come to work smelling like marijuana because they then go and make deliveries to people's homes, right? Um, that's a dress code thing for us kind of thing. Like um, what are the, um, you know, what, what are the parameters here? Um, if the person appears to be impaired, the best thing to do is document that you think that they are impaired and kind of move on. 
So now we get to go back and take some of these questions. And so we've left about 15 minutes to do so. Um, I don't know, before we go to that, Lauren, um, yeah, so Angela, I know you're gonna give us some of the some of the better ones, but but before I before I, I go there, like Lauren, what did I miss? Because I was moving the slides forward. I was just gonna jump into the very end there. Um, yeah, let me go back. What you can change. So, oh, you don't have to show it up. Just what, one of the, you know, Nancy and Eric Harris, we said not to really give legal advice, but to try and give you some practical advice where possible. Um, you know, even though you can't take action based on simply a positive quote unquote marijuana test, as Nancy said, like if you're, if you're trying to mark down reasonable suspicion or note why you think someone's under the influence or whatever, you know, one of the things that we're recommending to people is to adjust your policies so that you don't need a drug test for things. So where Nancy just said, like, if someone has possession, if someone comes to work with marijuana, don't test them. That is a violation of your policy. Likewise, if you have people who operate machines or drive cars or do anything, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's reasonable suspicion testing, or we do post-accident testing. Well, you can also change policies to simply add extra rules in terms of if an accident's your fault or deemed your fault, you can be fired even if you don't test positive, even if you're not under the influence. And that way, no test is necessary, just you engaged in conduct and you're being fired for that violation. So that's just one thing I wanted to add as that's a really good point. Post -accident, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, post-accident testing, you know, sort of started as sort of a part of the employer's investigation. What caused this accident? Was it something that we could have done differently? And then if the person was, you know, using drugs, they could say, okay, well, we think that that was a factor and, you know, maybe we'll do more education or we'll try and make sure our supervisors are keeping a closer eye on things. But, you know, if you can't do that test or you can't act on that test, that doesn't mean you can't still say, well, you know, but the problem is you are not a safe employee. That's, that's, the root problem there. So I think that's fairly a good idea. All right, Angela, how many questions did we get? <laughs> well, I have to say, um, you did a great job of addressing the questions in real time. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, before we go into some of the questions that have been uh, submitted that we didn't get to, an evaluation is popping up for all of our um, uh, attendees. So if you could just give us some feedback um, on today's presentation. Uh, as we go through some of the questions that were submitted, we would um, appreciate that. So, um, you know what, I'll go um, right to this question and not sure, um, you know, I, I feel like you kind of addressed it a bit, but can you speak a little bit more on what an employer can do to monitor and enforce their policy? Well, um, yeah. Um, if knowing without knowing what the policy is <laughs> go ahead Mara. i would say train supervisors to know the signs and to know what we're looking for for quote unquote reasonable suspicion um so i think training i think training supervisors is a huge step that's necessary for enforcement um you know i've gotten phone calls that say oh some guy was showing up for the past two weeks we think he was under the influence but no one did anything because the supervisor who was there saw him didn't know that they were supposed to do anything. So I yeah, think that if you want to be able to enforce your rules, people need to know your rules. So I think that's probably number one on my list of what you should do. Yeah. And I mean, there are other things that employers do, you know, workplace, um, uh, you know, making sure people aren't bringing marijuana or marijuana products to the workplace, um, under, you know, making sure people understand the rules about that. Um, not acting like it's none of their business, you know, if there's marijuana in the parking lot. I mean, it's a very unlikely a federal officer is going to come by to your parking lot, but, you know, sometimes that happens um, or there's safety issues or things like that. And that can, I, I definitely uh, have been involved in situations where an employer allowed, and this was not in New Jersey, but allowed someone to use marijuana medically. And that individual did strike and kill a pedestrian in a crosswalk on the way to a meeting, um, you know, told the employer they were unfamiliar with the way to the meeting and they were looking, you know, they, they didn't come to a full stop at the red light and they looked at their phone to see what the next direction was. Um, it wasn't until much later that it became clear that um, the individual had the marijuana out in their vehicle. And when the arrest, you know, the officer responding to the scene came, um, you know, they were definitely charged with DUI and a bunch of things, which complicated, right? The, everything from the employer, including what the uh, monetary settlement was was in the end. So 
you know, don't ignore the signs or symptoms. You know, if you think that people come back from their lunch break smelling like marijuana, that is something you can deal with, right? And if you've got, you know, people who are vaping, make sure their vape cartridges don't have THC on premises, things like that. No, that, that's really great. Um, great advice. And I know, I just want to mention that as a member of Drugs Don't Work in New Jersey, we have supervisor trainings. I know, Lauren, you've taken uh, part in some of those um, webinars that we hold throughout the year, providing that training. And we can also offer that um, one-on-one. So uh, we we'll put some information up in the chat for all of you to see, um, to feel free to contact us if, if you could benefit from some of that um, training. Happy to get that to you. Um, and so a uh, question that we had is, so as Lauren knows here in New Jersey, we have a, a big seasonal workforce, especially in the summer at the shore. And a lot of those employer employees are under the age of 21. So what does that mean uh, under the age of 21 and, and sometimes under the age of 18? What does that mean for our policies? Well, so technically the law does not protect, does not cover, does not legalize the use of marijuana in people under the age of 21. So- Except for maybe medical, right? Yes. Exactly, yeah. except for medical, but the recreational law that just passed does not. So, I mean, technically they're not protected. I guess it, you know, so you can still test, you can still do what you need to do. It wouldn't be the lawful use of marijuana unless they had a medical marijuana card. And the follow-up to that on medical marijuana, um, when should an employee or should there be a policy about when an employee should disclose their medical marijuana status or a medical marijuana card? I think so. I think it should be treated just like any other re request for workplace accommodation. You know, state laws differ to some respect in this regard, but, you know, New Jersey has a medical marijuana law, but it also has the law against discrimination. And Lauren and I have talked about this, you know, many times. If you are an individual who is granted a medical marijuana card in the state, then you may also sort of on, almost automatically, although you know every, every situation is a little different, be considered a, a person with a disability. And I would say from an employer's perspective, if somebody comes to you with a card, you should say, hmm, maybe this is an employee with a disability, right? And so what, what, what would the reasonable accommodation be? Just so just as you would say, oh, you know, you need a larger monitor, you need flexible work hours to do whatever, the same with the medical marijuana. And I would document it exactly uh, the same as you would. And, and uh, you know, m my belief is more documentation is better, but that's because I'm a defense lawyer. <laughs> Lauren, what else would you tell them to do? No, I just, I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think that also you have to be careful about asking people if they are, I mean, treat it like a disability. So, I mean, I think ideally it would be great if employees gave it to us earlier rather than later, put us on notice so we could accommodate, but also you can't really ask or, you know, dig into that. Much unless unless. Until, yeah, I mean, I think that that gets back to like, you know, communicating your policy. If your policy is you can't use or come to work or whatever, um, you know, you communicate that and then you can say, you know, if you're in need of an accommodation, um, exactly. you know, please report to HR and just hope that they do so. Um, if they come to work impaired and they haven't disclosed that they're a medical marijuana patient, I don't know that that necessarily means you can't take discipline, but it would be something to talk to your your employment counsel about, right? Like, oh, you know, did we know? Should we have known? Can we accommodate it this time? Um, what were the circumstances? Exactly, and I would also just send a make a little reminder. So, under New Jersey's medical marijuana law, there's a requirement to send that New Jersey notice when people test positive, mm. and that law technically has not gone away, even though it seems to be supplanted temporarily. So make sure that's that a good point. Even so when we're dealing with recreational marijuana, we should follow the medical marijuana guidelines to exactly we let them know that they tested positive and give them a chance to tell us if they have a card or what their deal is. So it, it kind of a mess. It would be easier if they could combine the two laws and give us one way to go. But, apparently. but yeah, I mean, if somebody tests positive, you won't necessarily know if it's for medical or recreational. So you should send that notice. And just, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's just something that says you've tested positive for marijuana. Would like, do you want to submit any information for us to, you know, consider with respect to this? And then um, they have a chance to, for, I mean, what we expect, you know, what, when the law was passed was that they would say, oh, I have a medical card. And then if they have a medical card, then they will have, um, you know, protections and you won't perhaps be able to act immediately uh, on the results of that test. Although the reason Lauren says it's been supplanted is, you know, 
before the recreational law, you could say, well, it was reasonable suspicion, so maybe we'll let you go anyway. But if it was post-accident or random or something else, well, well maybe not post-accident, but random test, you'd say, well, you haven't actually come to work impaired. So we're going to accommodate your medical marijuana use now because you probably won't be testing unless there's reasonable suspicion. It may not make that much of a difference, but exactly. as, as we say, it's, it's, um, you know, to, to the, to the person who said like, if it, you know, if somebody, um, uh, comes to work impaired, you can act. But if you if you don't think you have um, the information to show that they're impaired, uh, it may not matter why they're using as long as they're over 21. All right, well, we are coming to the end of our time. So before I give you both the opportunity to leave us with one uh, last thought, um, I have a question about, are there any occupations um, that are um, differently impacted by this law, including teachers, uh, social workers. I'm sure you've seen, uh, there have been many questions. I know many of you who are on have submitted questions asking if uh, LCADCs or any other group um, are exempt from these marijuana, I guess, protections. So uh, could you address that? Teachers, uh, social workers, any group? So, I think the recreational marijuana laws don't necessarily carve out anyone, even in safety sensitive roles, unless there's a separate law covering them. So, um, whether, you know, whether a school district, right, or the teacher's duties may change that, um, I'm not familiar with any that would say, you know, a teacher for example, couldn't be a medical marijuana patient. But I also know that they're typically public sector, they're typically unionized, and there may be um, specific, you know, either they're doing work that's covered by a federal grant, right, for disabled kids, so there could be a lot of different things. But I don't think there's a general exception. Do you, Lauren, am I missing no. anything there? You're not. Um, okay. Everyone, everyone wants there to be a general exception. And, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, there. No, nope, it would simply... be convenient. There simply is not. <laughs> you know, I know we were discussing this prior uh, to today's webinar, um, and, but I wanted to make sure that we got that uh, question out there because I know many uh, people have asked. So, um, you know, I'm just going to, we're going to be wrapping up. Again, I want to thank everyone who was on. I'm going to uh, allow our uh, experts to leave us with one last thought. Um, Lauren, we'll go to you first to give us that New Jersey perspective or anything else you want to uh, leave everyone with today? Um, I know people were asking about any other legislation. I would just say that the session ended. We have a new session now. So we're kind of starting back at square one. So there had been legislation introduced last session to kind of not require a wire for safety sensitive positions or kind of change whether wires were required or whether you could have your own employer trained to do this. We're kind of starting back at square one. Um, some similar laws or some laws from last time have been reintroduced. I honestly, it's too early to tell if they're getting traction. Um, those of you in New Jersey know the Speaker of the House was ousted. It, the election kind of caused a lot of turmoil down in Trenton. So I think the committees, three of the four committees have new heads. I, I, it's just kind of been a slow roll at the start of this session. So I think that, um, there hopefully will be more answers for everyone coming, just uh, New Jersey's getting back up and running in February. So I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the change of the Senate president definitely um, has an impact on a lot of things. So we'll see how things um, move that way. And uh, Nancy, any? Um, yeah, so I very unfairly put up that slide showing that New Jersey and New York are sort of out in front here and doing things that are really unheard of in other jurisdictions that have medical marijuana or sorry, recreational marijuana and have had some for a long time. Um, but just to kind of show you how different it was, New, New Jersey is also super different from all of the other jurisdictions that I work with in that you have Drugs Don't Work New Jersey, you have the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey. Most jurisdictions do not. And so as um, difficult as this topic is, I, I, I mean, I just want to like, I don't, I don't get paid to say this. You have great resources here with the partnership. Um, and so they've made this training available. They've made these toolkits available. Um, it's a really good thing. And I, you know, thank you for having us on um, because really, I think you're, you're, from what I can tell, you're really adding a lot of value to the employers. And so you guys are lucky in that at least you have these guys to help you out. 
Well, thanks for that. And again, thank you uh, to you and Lauren for being with us today and sharing your expertise on this very um, complicated and, and uh, confusing issue for so for so many of us. So uh, appreciate you being with us. Appreciate all of our attendees um, being with us today. I know we've shared information in the chat on how to access the digital toolkit, as well as contact information for Bill Lillis, the program coordinator. Um, we'll be sending out emails post event um, with the slides and recording and also contact information uh, so you can get additional information. But again, um, thank you to our panelists for being with us today. Thank you for our attendees, everyone. Um, have a great day and uh, be well. Thank you so much. Thanks.